Hello and welcome in to Tunnel Vision, a show presented to you by uscfootball.com. Thank you all for coming in and joining us on this Thursday of Fresno State Week. We've got myself, we've got Shotgun Sprattling, RJ Abadia in the studio. We're live on three platforms right now. But anyways, thank you guys for coming in. We can leave comments on YouTube, Facebook. We'll put them on the screen. No live callers this week. You guys can maybe explain why Ryan's not here, but us three very excited to bring you guys the preview for Fresno State. USC Fresno State in the Coliseum should be a packed game. We're excited to preview it. Well, we'll start with why Ryan's not here, because he's big balling out in the desert. Uh, so, you know, he's got more important things to do than this little live show. So he's just having the minions being us uh, ha have to do all the work for him on a Thursday. Uh, but, you know, we're, we're excited to be here. Another big game coming up for USC. You know, some people could look at this and say, oh, is this a trap game for USC? Coming off a big win at Stanford, 41-28 there. Had some opportunities to make it even bigger. Maybe get those second stringers in there for another opportunity. But the second half didn't really go the way USC would necessarily plan it. So we'll talk about that and a couple other things. Uh, Jack, you know, where do you want to start? I mean, there's so many things we can start with. We can start with the USC commitment that just happened on, uh, on national television with Sam Green, the defensive lineman from Maryland, making one of the quickest commitments that there is, kind of flashing a USC shirt and then going on and back, back to his business. So... Where are we starting at, Jack? Lead, lead us the way. Lead the way here for us. Well, I know Chris isn't here. He's the recruiting guy. He's the Maryland guy. But yes, let's start with the Sam Green commitment. RJ Shotgun, you guys want to take that one away? I mean, I'll just start in real quick because I don't know that I have a ton of things to say. But I do think every line of scrimmage commitment they get is worth paying attention to and worth noting. And I think once again, when you look at Sam Green's overall recruiting profile. Maybe this isn't one that's going to set hearts aflutter or get people super excited. But I think at this moment, we kind of have to give this staff the benefit of the doubt that if they're going after a guy that they see value in, you know, until proven that, that they don't see those kind of guys as diamonds in the rough and they don't pan out, I think we have to trust at least a little bit that this is something to be excited about. And like I said, the line of scrimmage is the next step for this program and kind of for Lincoln Riley, to be honest with you. Like if you're talking about him jumping into that next level, you got to have guys at the line of scrimmage who are good. And, and the second point I would make is just kind of what we were talking about before that DMV, you know, whether we're handing out assists to Chrissy T or not, like USC is making that a real focus point and they're delivering, they're closing from all the way across the country in a place where, it's not necessarily just a given that kids are going to be in love with USC in the way that they are out here. Yeah, definitely. And I, I think that you're creating a pipeline. You know, it may be a coast to coast pipeline now, but USC has actually gone into that DMV area and gotten multiple players now, starting even before Lincoln Riley arrives with Colin Mobley um, and being able to go in there. You get Caleb Williams, and suddenly you have the attention of everyone in that region. You add Jordan Addison, and now everyone's like, oh, USC's a team I'm going to watch every weekend because I know of those guys. They're from my area. I'm going to continue to watch them and see what's going on. So now USC's recruiting in that area and being able to pull a, a player from St. Francis, another big-time school, you know, a, a school that plays a national schedule. I think they played St. John Bosco a few years ago. Um, so, you know, they're going to have talent a lot. Uh, so that's a team that you, if you get in, with someone like Sam Green, maybe that leads you to getting some of the bigger name guys down the road. Um, it, you know, the way they're going about it, you know, you're seeing a lot of those linemen commits uh, recently. And, uh, you know, just guys, they've, they've thrown out some more offers. And that makes you wonder about, hey, that Mateo Ungalele uh, at St. John Bosco, is that one kind of gone by the wayside? Do they feel like they don't have a chance there? And that's why they're going out and offered some of these other D linemen recently. Or do you pick up Sam Green? You know, that makes the uh, the hurt uh, if you do lose Mateo uh, a little bit, uh, lessen that a little bit just because you're able to go out of state and get someone and you're already adding someone to the class. You're not waiting around and waiting to the last minute and then suddenly you are you feel like you're light on the defensive line because you didn't go out and get somebody. So, you know, I, I think that they're attacking those lines. They're still going to continue to work on that throughout, and they have to. Just like RJ said, that's been the one knock on Oklahoma and – Lincoln Riley even talked about today. I asked about the offensive line. He said, hey, you win, we win the trenches. You know, the trenches are where everything is won. If you don't have trenches, you can't win a championship. He's mentioned that multiple times. So that's offensive line and defensive line. And so they have to recruit those guys, those elite-level guys. And, you know, 
getting someone out of a powerhouse program like Sam Green is usually those guys are a little bit uh, ahead of the curve as well as your, your normal high school player that's coming from a, you know, a small town or what it may, whatever it may be. So, you know, being able to pick up someone, maybe that enables him to step in a little bit earlier. And as you continue to mold this roster and develop this roster, you're going to have to continue to add bodies to that defense line because they're going to be losing some guys in the next year to two years on that defense line. So they got to continue to add bodies there and continue to, to build that depth. Yeah, and I think you could even just look at the current team and what we've seen through two games to realize you need numbers. You always need numbers on the defensive line. You don't know who you're going to have every single week necessarily. You don't know who's going to be playing their best week to week necessarily. And so, you know, it matters in a game if you can legitimately run six to seven to eight guys out there for the first three quarters. It hasn't mattered that much in the first two games, really, but it matters over the course of a season. And then the other thing I would just say is, you know, I think one of the big boxes USC fans are looking forward to Lincoln Riley checking is really kind of shoring up the local recruiting, the elite local talent. But until that happens, there's nothing to say that USC can't also be going into other backyards, whether it's Florida, whether it's the DMB, whether it's Georgia, whether it's Texas. There's no reason that they can't be going in and taking people out of places where people don't think they should in the same way that there are a lot of schools nationally right now making hay in the L.A. area in the wake of the last few years of USC football. And it also says that USC is garnering that national attention as well. The fact that, you know, the their recruits that they brought in are guys from the DMV or guys from around the country, you know, multiple Texas guys. So USC is not just – you know, the local, they, you know, they need to identify and land those top local kids, but they don't have to be only local right now because, you know, they're, they're showcasing that they are a national brand. Once again, everyone talking about USC the last couple of weeks uh, around the country, even though they haven't played a marquee game yet. Now, that doesn't mean that uh, it's going to be a cakewalk for them because they come up and they play a Fresno State team this week that could give them a lot of troubles, actually. Yeah, and I think that's a, a really great point, Shotgun. Um, you've, we've seen that the value that the USC offensive line has had so far early in this year, finally having an experienced group with four of, if not five, spots filled with experienced guys who have learned the system and clearly know it well. I was reading your article about the top graded players against Stanford. It was four of the offensive linemen. So the offensive line has been great, and it's time, I think, that SC develops that on the defensive line as well, a position group that's been struggling a little bit to open up the year, especially with stopping the run. So I think with Green here, who's someone mentioned a three-star guy, maybe not not only going out finding the four star five stars but guys that clearly fit the scheme fit what Alex Grinch wants to do because that's a particular type of player I think this is a move in the right direction for the Trojans yeah and the defensive line so far this season has been okay not you know not impressive not underwhelming just kind of okay you know Tuli Tupelotu had a really nice game this past week they moved him inside he had four tackles for loss uh you know he had a sack in there Solomon Bird comes in and plays that Russian spot, gets a couple of sacks in the game. You know, it, but they need guys to continue to step up. You, you need some of your veterans to step up. You need some of the you know high-profile guys like Corey Foreman to take that next step. And he graded out as the best player, best defensive player uh, for USC in, according to Pro Football Focus, but didn't have a huge impact in that game. So he's got to continue to work on himself and be able to to be able to get in there and play 50, 60 snaps for USC, especially with the concerns about Romello Height going forward. He did not practice at the beginning of this week. He was not at practice on Tuesday. Uh, Lincoln Riley said he and Cortland Ford, who left, uh, both of those guys left sun, Saturday's game at uh, Stanford left with injuries, said both of those guys would be rested and reevaluated later in the week. But I, I think it's going gonna, it's gonna to be hard for me to see, particularly Romello Height being available on Saturday against Fresno State. We'll see where Cortland Ford is. Lincoln did say that he had been progressing in the couple of days since Saturday, so we'll see if he's available. If not, you have a great backup there in Bobby Haskins. And that's the deal with the defensive line is you got to build that quality depth to be able to sustain an injury. Okay, okay, Dejon Benton's not available. Tyrone Tolini apparently was not available either. He was with USC, but seemed like he was only an emergency usage guy because he had played and played pretty well against Rice, did not play at all against Stanford. So I would assume that there was some kind of injury there and that he was not available. We'll see if he's available this week. 
But when you have a couple guys go down, who's going to step up? And that's been the big question with USC's defensive line right now. You know Tulu Tupelo two is going to make some plays, but who else on that front is going to make some? Dejon Benton made some against Rice, but he he left the game or you know he uh, had to exit, um, was not available for the Stanford game. So you know who's going to step up? And you know not necessarily anyone really stepped up and had a huge performance against Stanford like you would want to see when someone gets a, gets some extra opportunities out there. So that's going to be something. The defense line coming into the season was the biggest question mark for USC, right? You know, didn't know about the depth, didn't know about the quality of depth. Seems like the depth's a little bit stronger than it has been, than maybe we anticipated, just with some of the guys that have got in there, the Tyron Tolini, you know, Solomon Bird making some plays, and Dejon Benton really stepping up in fall camp. But when you have those injuries, who's going to step up? And I think that, you know, for them to, if they can make more of an impact, especially when you faced an offense like that slow mesh from Stanford, you need those defensive linemen to be attacking, especially in the system USC runs. They need to be attacking and disrupting things early so that it takes some of the pressure off the linebackers to have to make that decision. Is this a run? Is this pass? If you're getting more pressure quicker, Tanner McKee's got to make his decision quicker, and that's not that's what didn't happen in this game. He was able to sit back there, wait and wait and wait, and see what that safety was doing or see what that linebacker was doing that he was reading, and that gave – the linebackers in particular fits. They really struggle in this game, just kind of waiting to find out, is this going to be a run? Is it going to be a pass? Now they're gonna, not going to face that same type of offense, but they've got to improve continually too. So that front seven in particular on the USC side, that's a big question mark, front six for, for most of the time, most of their plays. That's something that's got to improve week over week over week as they go for this defense to, to continue to get better. Because you watch that second half, and, you know, not necessarily the third quarter. They only, I think Stanford only had nine or ten plays in the third quarter. USC held the ball for a long time. But when they got rolling in that fourth quarter and moved the ball, it was just chunk play after chunk play after chunk play. I mean, that was a lot of the first half, too. Stanford had 20 plays that, made, that gained at least 10 yards. And that's not including the five pass interference penalties that were called. So, you know, they, had, they ran 80 plays in this game, but a quarter of those plays – gained at least 10 yards. I mean, now USC, give them credit. They're opportunistic on defense. They're creating takeaways. They're creating explosive plays. But there's going to be games where those don't happen. So what's going to happen then? Can you keep a team out of the end zone, hold them to a field goal if you're going with a bend but don't break? There's still some areas where you know you see some positives. You see the fact that they're rallying to the ball, the fact that they're putting you know the hat in the right place, the fact that there's – been only 10 missed tackles in the first two games. It's kind of mind-blowing. USC's at about half the uh, frequency of missed tackles as they were last year. But there's a lot of gaps over the middle with those throws that have been going on. There were some holes, some big holes for the running backs to run. EJ Smith, if he could just hold all the ball, could have had a monster game for Stanford. So there's definitely some concerns still with that defense. And you're facing a quarterback in Jake Hayner coming up who's got a chip on his shoulder who's shown that he can put up big-time numbers in big-time games for Fresno State, threw for 455 yards against UCLA last year in a win, you know, threw for over uh, near, I think it was 299 against uh, Oregon or Oregon State, and over 300 in the other one when he faced those two teams. So this guy can can come in and put up some stats. So USC's got to be prepared. They've got to get better from where they were last week. Yeah, and RJ, I mean, we, we can get into Jake Kaner and Fresno State, but I want to touch on something that Shotgun said, which is this defense has been very opportunistic so far, but there's going to be games where that doesn't happen. I know we got to talk with Alex Grinch and a bunch of the players on defense this week because they're already eight turnovers to their 24 turnover goal for the season. Do you expect the opportunism can can keep it up? I think Grinch said, like, name me a reason it can't in his uh, presser the other day, but do you think this is something they can keep up game to game? I mean, at that level, no. I mean, I, I don't think it takes a football genius to say that USC is probably not going to lose any game where they go plus four turnover margin and score touchdowns on their first five drives. It's <laughs> virtually impossible to lose, no matter who you are under that circumstance. But I do think, yes, you preach turnovers. And, and the one thing that can sustain itself is the intent, is the aggression, and the physicality. You can do those things and check those boxes and still not get four turnovers in a game, but that should be the constant. Because to be honest with you, and I think Shotgun kind of alluded to it already, if you are building your defensive hopes on getting turnovers, you're building on sand. You're building on quicksand. Like real legit defenses get stops. They don't just let you go up and down the field constantly and hope or 
you know, to their credit, make things happen inside the 20. It's just not realistic. It's not sustainable. Um, but, you know, having said that, I think the point about the defensive line is really, really important. And it also leads to kind of one of the fallacies, I think, that people have when they look at USC schedule and they're like, well, I don't see how they would lose to this team. I don't see how they would lose to this team. I think if you look at Fresno State in isolation, yeah, you probably don't see how they would lose to Fresno State or maybe to Oregon State next week. But football is such a cumulative thing, right? And a question I would ask, I don't know if Shotgun, I, I don't know if he has this off the top of his head. I'd be impressed if he does. But like, how many of how many snaps did Tuli Tui Pulotu have last week? And on how many of them was he double teamed? Right? If he plays 60 snaps and he's getting double teamed, two out of every three snaps, three out of every four snaps, that's not the same Tuli Tui Puloto in the next game as if USC's defensive line is quality enough that you can't double team him 30 and 40 times, that you have to put single guys on him and give him single reps. Like all snaps are not created equal. We've talked extensively kind of before we came on about how valuable PFF grades are, but they're not infallible. And there's plenty of things that they just don't know because they can't know, right? And so when you talk about the need to build depth, it's a real thing in the here and now for USC. Because again, you have an elite player like Thule. If he's getting double teamed, if he's getting beat up, if he's got to play fourth quarters, like the one defense was in that fourth quarter. They really shouldn't have been, right? That all adds up cumulatively, and it makes a Fresno State the next week maybe a little different challenge, or Oregon State the week after, depending on how this game goes. So all this stuff is kind of interrelated, and I think ultimately it just speaks to the fact that the USC defense has done a lot of things to like, but they've got a lot of things to address. Yeah, I, I think RJ brings up a great point there. Tule played over 70 snaps in the game. Um, I don't know how many he was double teamed on, um, but the fact that you, you're going to build that accumulation because the defense was on the field for 80-something snaps. It was 80 official snaps plus six more, I believe it was, that there were penalties called on it, five or six. So you're playing 85, 86 snaps. Now, of course, not everybody's playing that, but when you have a defensive lineman playing over 70 snaps, that's a huge number. You want to get that number down to between 45 and 50 if you can. You know, you want to be able to only have to play, be on defense for 50, 60 snaps in a game. And then if Tuli plays almost every snap, it's not as big of a number as, as you know, you're putting up when he's on. And the, you just have to give him more rest, you know, the more snaps that you're given there. So – Partly that's going to happen when you have an explosive offense and when you're taking those shots downfield and Jordan Addison scores on one play, you're going to get a quicker drive. But at the same time, if your offense, you know, executes in the second half a little bit more, now they kept the defense off the field for only, I think it was, like I said, I think it was 10 snaps for Stanford in the, in the third quarter. But then the offense didn't do much of anything in the fourth quarter at all. And because of that, okay, now the defense is back out there again, and the defense is back out there again. The defense is back out there again. And if you blow them out, you score a couple more touchdowns a little bit earlier in the second half instead of those field goal opportunities or maybe one more drive where you, you, you score, uh, then suddenly the game's out of reach and David Shaw is putting in his backup quarterback and you know, you're seeing Ari Patu and you're seeing a different defense out there on the field, and that just saves those guys that much more because of the limited depth the limited talented depth that you have on that defensive front. You know, if you got a guy like Tulu Tupelo too that you want to put out there all the time because he's just better than everybody else on your team, that's when you're going to run into those, those type of situations because it's not necessarily the Fresno State game. I think it's the Oregon State game that you worry about because Fresno is going to run a, you know, a high-octane offense. If they put up a bunch of points, you have a shootout, all those plays that add up. Now you go to Oregon State, and they're trying to run the ball down your throat. And suddenly your defense line is just not getting off of blocks as easily. You know, your linebackers maybe banged up a little bit. Those type of things, I think it's a great point by RJ, the accumulative effect there. But then as you slowly get through the season and you run up on that Utah game and then they try to do the same thing to you, and that's when you, you could be in real trouble. Uh, so they've got to just take care of business first. And, you know, when they have the opportunity, and it comes back to execution. I think the defense, you know, there's some issues there. But the offense looks so crisp in the first half 
and so meh in the second half. You know, you still saw some things like, okay, there's a play, there's a play, but you just didn't have that flow and there was a couple penalties. It was just small things. And Jack mentioned this, we were talking about it before the show, but yeah, it's just small things that, yeah, you can get that correct. You get, But that's what Graham Harrell's offense was. You would say, oh, they were moving really smooth and then that one penalty, you know, forced them into a, a first and 20 and they didn't recover. Well, that's how, you know, when your things are running smooth, you make up for a mistake and come back with the next play and it's explosive. When things aren't going smooth, suddenly that you get that snowball effect. You can't recover from a one penalty. Everything kind of has to go smooth as it goes. And I still think that in the second half, they pull back the reins on the play calling a little bit. You know, some of the creative stuff that they have been running throughout the game, maybe they pull back a little bit. Let's save some stuff that we're not going to use you know, before the Fresno State game or for, before that Oregon State game or whatever team that we think, uh, you know, kind of aligns with the Stanford defense. I think that played into it. But they could still go out there and they should be able to dominate, you know, Stanford's front with their offensive line. They should be able to execute well enough to be able to, you know, have success against Stanford and, you know, more success than just running the clock out in the third quarter. Go and finish off those drives, especially if you get a big explosive play on the first play of the second half. You know, now take advantage, you know, stick it down their throat and, you know, uh, put the put the game out of reach in the first five minutes of the third quarter. And you got a completely different second half, I think. So that's something that one, I think, is a learning experience. And I think that's what happens when you have a team that has a couple of guys that have won. But it's not a team that's won before. You know, there's a couple of those transfers that have come to USC or some guys from high school that have had success. But this team hasn't won together. This, the, the vast majority of the players on this team haven't been on a really successful team that knows how to do that. And that kind of is something that's lingering from the previous regime of where they didn't know how to finish off teams. They didn't know how to just blow teams out and pull away and get that second group in. That was a game on Saturday that they should have been able to, to get the, the backups in and get them some more time. You know, when you're leading 35-14 at the half, you score a couple more times, make it 49-14, you know, suddenly that game's out of reach and Stanford's not going to be trying to do too much anyways. Yeah, no, I think that uh, that definitely makes sense. Of course, there are reasons to think that a team could play better, as Lincoln Riley's mentioned all week. Like, no team is perfect, but as I said in instant analysis the other day with Chris, like, the good teams improve as the season goes on. I think the great teams win while they still have things to work on. That's what we've seen from SC so far through the first two games, and there's clearly the potential that we see of those blowouts and taking care of opponents like we saw in the first half against Stanford. RJ, maybe we start getting into Fresno State a little bit. What have you seen uh, when previewing this game? Maybe we can start it off with Jake Hayner, who's going to be one of the best quarterbacks that USC will see all year. So it's a weird circumstance that I can't imagine has happened very often where a team watches its next two opponents play one another. <laughs> but that's basically what we got for those of you who either were at the Stanford game or were watching it. And then late night, there's Fresno State and Oregon State in a classic Pac-12 after dark that Oregon State pulled out. Um, but I think when you look at what Fresno State did in that game, they scored on seven of their 11 possessions. With a minute to with a minute ten to go, their win probability was eighty three percent. So you're talking about fifty nine through fifty nine minutes and ten seconds. Fresno State was on their way to beating a team who I think the three of us certainly feels is going to give USC problems in two weeks, right? So I think that's a that's a decent measuring stick of what Fresno State can bring into the Coliseum. Um, if you're talking about just push comes to shove, the bottom line is right now through two games. Points per drive, um, their defense is ranked 105th. That's just not going to be good enough. I mean, I just there's just no way that I think they're going to hold USC down for four quarter for one or two quarters, let alone four. But it's one of those things where I think, to your point, um, Jack. But the idea that great teams don't win close games, great teams avoid close games. So. I would be surprised if Fresno State can hang in long enough with USC. But if they do, I would in no way be surprised to see Jake Hayner making the difference in a close fourth quarter and just outright winning that game or keeping it tight. You know, if the, the hurdle to me for Fresno State is to not be blown out of the building when it gets late. If it gets late and it's a game, Jake Hayner's a guy. You know, he's got talent. He's got Nico Remigio, former Cal, I'm pretty sure former modern-day wide receiver, um, mm -hmm. who had 
six catches on six targets for 100 yards against Oregon State, and he has um, 100 yard receiving games in both the games this season. So they can score, they can move the ball. And so the more that you leave this game in the hands of Jake Hayner, the more trouble it becomes, is I guess where I kind of come out on it. Yeah, I think it's a great way to put it. USC needs to put them away. You know, you don't want to let them hang around. You know, you always talk about, oh, you don't let the underdog hang around. They get more confidence, all those things. I think you also start to worry a little bit more if you're the favorite when you haven't been in that position like USC. You know, the fact that I, I have faced it, someone like Caleb Williams, he's just so cool, calm, and collected. He'll be fine. But if there, is there someone else that drum, drops the ball or fumbles because the moment gets to them? Because they haven't been in those type of situations in the past, they're not used to being the big dog, not used to being a team that is being ballyhooed as a potential college football playoff uh, type of program. You know, those type of things that, that, that go into it, how is, how is the rest of the team going to react? I think Caleb will be fine, but when he throws the ball out there, is someone going to drop it? Is it going to go through someone's hands and JT Daniels off the receiver's helmet right to the defender? You know, I, I don't think Caleb Williams can do anything about that. So, you know, I, I think that the talent that USC's brought in can do that, but they've got to show that they can do it as the, you know, as the top dog, as the team that everyone's coming to face and got to get used to that. That's something they still have to get used to, I think, um, just being that team that everyone is circling on their on their schedule because that's the way USC normally is in the Pac-12. Everyone wants to beat you. doesn't matter how the rest of their season is going. If they can beat USC when USC is on top, they feel like, okay, we've accomplished something. And that's what the, this team has to kind of get used to, I still think. Uh, so I, I think that, you know, if they – for USC, it's, it'll behoove them to just blow Fresno State out. I mean, you, you would say that about every game. But – that's the type of team Fresno State is that if you let them hang around, suddenly that doubt starts creeping in. Suddenly you get an instant classic late night Pac-12 after dark type stuff starts happening. Pac-12 refs will let that type stuff happen. So, you know, those are the type of things you want to avoid if you're USC. And Jake Hayner is perfectly the type of quarterback to make some late night magic happen. We've seen him do it against Pac-12 teams already. So, uh, you know, I don't know why you would think anything other with him. But again, I think it eventually goes back to what RJ said. Their defense is not very good. And because of that, USC should be able to score repeatedly. Just put the pressure on constantly on Fresno State to, hey, you got to match this score every time or you're just not going to keep up. And if you do that, then I think eventually Fresno State falters and USC pulls away. But wh what point of the game will that falter happen? That'll be, that'll be the interesting part. And can USC continue to sustain the fact that they are dominating the takeaway ratio. You know, their turnover margin, what is it, 8-0 net right now? I mean, they, they're forcing four turnovers a game, and they haven't turned the ball over yet. They've had a couple of bobbled uh, punt returns. But that's about it. They had one bad snap, I think it was, uh, in the first game. Everyone's been taking the ball, taking care of the ball really well. And if they can continue that, you're hard to beat all season, no matter who you play. But what happens that one game when suddenly things don't bounce your way, Something quirky happens. What do you, how do you react to it? And I think that's something we still got to learn about this USC team. Yeah, and I think to your point about people that can handle the bright lights, of course USC is going to be circled on everyone's schedule, the opposing teams that they come play. This game, though, is a 7.30 p.m. at night game. I feel like it's not getting the national hype that some other games would get. Even last week against Stanford was ESPN's national broadcast, but it didn't really feel like that. So I feel like right now the start of the season has been perfect for the Trojans to get their feet underneath them, start off with Rice, move up a little bit to Stanford. I think now you got a little bit of a bigger leap to Fresno State, but they're staying – I mean, outside of the AP poll, because they're ranked seventh now, staying out of, I think, the limelight where everyone is watching. Uh, I think it's good for, for the team to be able to get their feet wet. I know Lincoln Riley doesn't want to use this as an excuse, but they are all learning how to play with each other, how to play under a new scheme. Pretty much every player or coach is in a new place, learning a new scheme, So except Caleb Williams, but he is now here in Los Angeles, not Oklahoma. So I think there's a lot of things this team is still figuring out. And I think it's good that the marginal steps up to hopefully getting to the Pac-12 title game if you're them. And I just think that this Fresno State is another step up, but still, it's not a huge leap. It's not like they're at a huge primetime slot where everyone's going to be watching them. And not there, there's a whole ton of pressure. So I think, to your point, I think that is uh, helpful for USC. I, I just think Fresno State is sneaky scary. Yep. Um, you know, I know their defense isn't very good, but when you have a quarterback like that, 
a little bit, just a little bit undersized, a six one. A guy that feels like he was, you know, he's got that chip on his shoulder. He feels like he was under recruited. USC actually recruited. It's not like USC didn't see him play because USC recruited Eric Cromanhook from Monte Vista High School, uh, which is the high school that Jake Hayner was at. I went to a game. John Baxter was there, who was the tight ends coach for USC at the time. So they saw Jake Hayner play in high school. It's not like he was just, you know, they popped up on the radar and they never saw him. But he feels like, hey, they didn't even offer me. They didn't do anything. So he went to Washington initially. So this is a Pac-12 level caliber quarterback, goes to Fresno State and has had a ton of success there. He's the type of player that can turn this game into, you know, could this be a 2000, was it 2004, 2005, you know, the Reggie Bush Fresno State game where it was just an instant classic where I was across the country and I remember flipping, I'm walking by a, a bar and the game was on. And I was like, I got to stop and watch this. I don't know what's going on. USC's ranked highly. This game's already how many points are on the board. I got to watch the rest of this. Uh, so ended up at that bar for the rest of the night, just watching this game. That's the type of late night classic this could become if USC lets for us no hang around. Yeah. I mean, I think, first of all, a quick point on Jake Hayner. He's going to do two things that Tanner McKee did not, that USC needs to be aware of. Number one, he's going to take risks. You know, he's going to throw balls that are the second we see, we see it, we're going to be like, Hmm. But when you take those kind of chances, you know, it's gambling, right? It's it's the roulette wheel. It's it's double down on blackjack, right? You hit a couple of those suddenly and you've tilted the field. You've tilted the score. You've tilted kind of the feel of the game. The other thing that he's going to do is be able to throw off platform. One of the really conspicuous things that happened on Saturday was – uh, against Stanford was anytime the pure pocket went away for Tanner McKee, it was almost an instant sack. Like the play was essentially over. It's not going to be over that quickly against Jake Hayner, you know? And so there is a different challenge. There is a different element that he brings. And for the reasons that Shotgun and I just talked about, like the twos need to be on the field in the fourth quarter of this game for the short term and the long term. Short term because don't, put yourself in the hands of what Jake Hayner might do in the fourth quarter. Why would you even just create that situation long-term for the other reasons that we've just been talking about that this team's DNA is being formed. This team's characters being formed last week. They played a pretty shoddy, low energy shoddy, not that kind of shoddy, a low energy second half. They lost, they lost the second half. They didn't even score a touchdown in the second half, right? You don't want that to be your week after week, DNA because when that cement holds when that when that cement hardens you know whenever that is that becomes a team you are and that shows up at the most inconvenient times so I, I really think that that's kind of the benchmark and it's not about arrogance it's not about like they're just so much better than Fresno State it's just that if they are on the arc to being the team that a lot of people think they are that's kind of what needs to happen yeah and I think that for the Clay Helton era, that became the team's mantra. That became like what the team was known for is they would play down to their competition. And that meant everyone that came into the Coliseum, be it Fresno State or, or lower name teams like San Jose State, they'd roll into the Cali and they think that they could hang for all four quarters and if not possibly even win the game at the end. And I think that Lincoln Riley and this staff have to make sure they don't take the foot off the pedal like they did against Stanford so that they don't start to garner that reputation, which also I feel like when Lincoln Riley was at Oklahoma, they'd have one of those losses every year when they'd lose to like a Kansas State or someone like that. That I just think when you're at a new program like, like Lincoln is at SC and you had what happened in the last regime, you don't want to start to have that the feeling around the team that anyone can come in and beat you in your own house. So I think you're right. The two's really got to be out there in the fourth quarter. Yeah, strike fear in your opponent before they ever even make it make it to the airport to, to come to visit. You know, that's how you, what you did during the Pete Carroll days. And even, you know, then they had some, you know, some games where they needed special players to bail them out. But there was a literal fear of going to play USC. Like, oh, uh, those guys hit hard. Those guys are huge. Their guys are fast. You know, when you're going there, it's an opportunity to go play and maybe knock off a ranked team. But it's also an opportunity to – to get your bell rung and to just get beat up and everything else. That was what the opponent had to, you know, kind of, you know, decipher when they were going in. That was their mindset. Like, all right, how, how are we going to approach this? 
that's something that can be established right now. I think you guys got to brought up a great point there of where you're setting that foundation. Um, and when it hardens, that concrete hardens, what is it going to be? And how is everyone going to look out at, at that, that, uh, that foundation? Is there going to be handprints all in that foundation or is it going to be nice, crisp, looks like it's a, you know, done by the, the best architectural company in, in the world? Yeah. And I think that, I mean, to that point, this USC team also, they hit hard. We had two force, two, there were two force fumbles last week. They're fast. Jordan Addison beat Gabriel Kelly multiple times. And that's the good stuff that Lincoln Riley has talked about all week, that those splash plays have been there all season so far. However, they need to raise the floor of play. And I think that's kind of what every USC fan has been saying this week, what we've been covering uh, here on the channel for a couple weeks now, is there are those splash plays. There are those players that can make tremendous plays, but they need to raise the floor of play. And I think we've got to see that continue to happen against Fresno State. All right, we can get into some questions. If you guys are on YouTube or Facebook, make sure you leave your questions. We can put them on the screen and we'll we'll answer all of these. One that I saw straight off the bat was, is it time to bench Makai Blackman with the penalties? Shotgun RJ, I don't know if you guys want to take on this, but I was very impressed with Makai Blackman in case you guys wanted to start off. I, I will fight somebody over <laughs> over cornerback play. Uh, fans just in general just don't understand how difficult it is to be a cornerback. And if you get a penalty, they think you're terrible. Uh, sometimes, one, it's better to get a personal uh, uh, a pass interference call in college if you're really beat because it's only 15 yards. It's not spot of the foul. Two, the Pac-12 refs were not very good on, on Saturday. I mean, there are, I think, two of Makai Blackman's. He got three. Now, hey, that's not a good stat to have. He was also thrown at 11 times. That's a huge number. You don't see very often that someone is targeted multiple uh, double-digit times. And he gave up, I think it was six catches or five catches on 11. Or maybe it was in less than that. I think it was three think catches only on 11. Three. Yeah, three catches plus the three penalties. That's how I was getting to six. But, uh, yeah, three catches on 11 targets. So, you know, Makai Blackman, and in, if you don't believe us, think that he played well, then let's ask Lincoln Riley. You know, what Lincoln Riley say? He played awesome. That was the quote that Lincoln Riley gave. You know, he gave he said on Trojans Live, he played really, really good. And then by Tuesday, he upped that to he played awesome. So Makai Blackman was thrown at a ton of times. He was asked to do something. They were putting him on a ton of islands. You know, there were a lot of ton of man-to-man -man coverage with a one high safety because they were bringing a safety down the box to try to deal with that slow mesh. So a lot of times you saw Max Williams creeping down into the box. So that meant one-on-one -on -one opportunities on the outside for Stanford. And that's their offense. That's been their offense for the past. They've added this slow mesh concept, but it's always been, hey, let's get that one-on-one -on -one matchup and throw it outside of the big boys. And I thought he did. He held his own. He, did, he wasn't outstanding on every single play. But then when you factor in a fourth down at the goal line, tip interception to yourself, you add in that he recovered a fumble. You add in that if the if uh, Casey Filkins, the running back, takes a half step more before Tua Sevi destroys him over the middle, that's another fumble that Makai Blackman would have returned for a touchdown. Like, all those things, he's around the ball all the time. So, yeah, I think Makai Blackman had a really good game. You know, I wouldn't say it was outstanding because he did still give up some catches and, you know, a couple of the penalties. But I thought he had a really good game in that one. And, you know, just in general, I will fight people over – uh, cornerback play and pass interference calls. Yeah, and I think, I mean, Lincoln and Alex Grinch were actually in lockstep to take it even further. I mean, I don't think they were speaking for all three calls, but on one of them in particular, Lincoln Riley and Grinch both literally just said, we will take that technique from him on every play in mm -hmm. every game for the rest of the year. I don't know how much more plain and obvious it can be <laughs> at that point. Like, I think... USC's got defensive questions. They've got players who do need to do some work. On the list of USC defensive problems, Makai Blackman is nowhere near, if not even on the list. I wouldn't even categorize him that way. I think he's been a net positive without any question. And that interception, I cannot tell you how crucial that was. You know, we spent the whole week talking about Stanford is going to put big dudes out there and they're going to straight up come after you. That's just the way it's going to be. That's what that's how they blew USC out last year. They went right to it right at the start of the game and Makai Blackman, there was nothing fluky about that. That was a 230 pound Elijah Higgins that he didn't not only took the ball, he had him boxed out. It wasn't like a lucky bounce. He had Elijah Higgins essentially playing defense 
by the time the ball arrived to both of them. And that was such a huge statement play in my mind. I think just a big moment. And yeah, it, yes. Are there guys who we need to work on on the USC defense? Yes. Makai Blackman, not one of them. No, I totally agree. I think Max Williams said the same thing as like, he, he even said himself, I think he even went as far to say that some of the past interference calls were wrong. I think when we interviewed him the other day, <laughs> but I, I think echoing what Lincoln and Alex Grinch said, it really did look like he had the right technique. Even if the, the calls seem right to the officials, like I don't think it was Makai's fault. He was in the right position. Sometimes things happen and sometimes you know, refs make, make the wrong choice. But maybe Shadi, you can start off this one. Andrew on Facebook asks, are you more concerned with the interior defensive line or the defensive ends? I think it depends on where you're classifying Tulu to a to. Uh, wherever he's not, then that's where I'm more concerned about. Um, he did move inside this game with Dejan Bitten being out. He's played on the outside previously. If you're, if you, I think you actually are benefited when he's inside because then you get Nick Figueroa on the field a little bit more. And I think if Corey Foreman just continues to develop, the edges get that much better um, because he's going to make some plays. You just got to get that consistency from him. You got to get him practicing hard all the time and earning the coach's trust in practice. And if that happens, then I think the defense only continues to get better. Whereas the interior, you're waiting on some, you, you, you got some old guys that can hold to the point of attack. But can they do more than that? And this defense, you want a guy like Dejan Benton who's quick and makes that first step and he's cutting through the line. So I don't know, you know, what exactly they're hoping to get out of Brandon Peely or Tyrone Tillini or some of these guys. Earl Barquett got his first action on Saturday, played a couple of snaps. But, you know, what are you expecting out of these guys? Because if you want to just hold the point of attack and other people go make plays, I think they can do that. But if you want them in this defense to be that speed defense and get them upfield – those guys just haven't made a ton of plays so far um, in, in this uh, in this season, the first two games, outside of Tolini's, uh, you know, sack against Rice. Yeah, I think that that definitely makes a lot of sense. We saw Solomon Bird play as well. He had a two-sack performance. Corey Foreman coming off the edge. Romello Height, hopefully when he comes back from injury, can pin, pick up where he left off. But So I think you're right. I think if, if you're considering Thule on the – Interior makes it a little closer if he's an edge, though. I would agree that probably you're more concerned with the interior defensive line. RJ, do you want to start on this question? Who do you think is more of a threat, Fresno State or Oregon State? That comes off from YouTube. Oregon State, it's not even close. The First of all, the quality of the team, even though they both just played a really close game, um, and the venue. I, I don't think you can discount. First of all, just categorically, I can tell you as someone who has now covered two different Pac-12 teams, crazy things happen in Corvallis. Just <laughs> categorically. It, I mean, I, I feel like if it's not the birthplace of Pac-12 After Dark, it's certainly, you know, one of the foremost locations that has built that reputation over the years. I mean, even Pete Carroll USC teams had wackiness happen to them in Corvallis. Like, it, that just fundamentally, the venue, the location, that's going to make a big difference. The other issue is just that Oregon State attacks you in the way that USC least wants to be attacked right now. And that is between the tackles, that's running the ball, that's running the ball even when you know they're running the ball. You know, those are the questions that USC has to answer. And, and I mean, we just talked about it, right? The interior defensive line. You know, when the interior defensive line does its job, it's creating downs and distances where the edge guys can make really fun things happen. It's harder to have that process inverted, right? It's harder to have the edge guys doing something on first or second down that sets up the interior defensive line to make a big play on third down, right? It usually happens the other way. And so when you talk about Oregon State, and, and also don't sleep on the things that they do throwing the ball and the things that they do throwing the ball off of their run. So, yeah, and also, I mean, to say nothing of the fact that I hate to be mean or anything, but, like, that Fresno State game last week was a classic Jeff Tetford meltdown end of game. Like, we've seen that happen before. Whereas I, personally, I am very high on Jonathan Smith. I think he's a really good coach. I think he's a great game planner. I think he's building that program up to just about as good as it can be. Um so, yeah, no question Oregon State's the danger. But as we've been saying, what they do against Fresno State makes Oregon State more or less of a problem, depending on how that game plays out. 
Yeah, I think that's definitely a good point. Maybe we uh, take a slight break from the questions because you mentioned that Oregon State runs the ball and that's what USC has struggled against so far this year. Fresno State might be one of the best passing attacks they'll see all season. Shotgun, do you think that it's almost better that they're facing the great passing team right now as opposed to the run and it allows them a little bit more time to figure out how to fit the run, get some guys healthy on the defensive line? I mean, it depends on USC's pass rush. You know, if guys are going to get home and, you know, get Hainer off his spot, force him to throw on the run, even though he can do those things, then, it, you know, it does, it, it, that does suit USC's strengths. But, you know, if you let him sit back there all, t- all night, then he's going to pick you apart. So I, I think it's a little bit of, of both. And one of the things I would say why Oregon State is, is, is the more difficult team is, because when they do throw the ball, it's over the middle to tight ends, and that's where USC's gaps in their defense have been so far. Between the nickels and between the safeties and, and linebacker coverage, like that's where the holes, the, the gaps in the defense have been so far, and that, that's something that has to be cleaned up and tightened up. And, like, and this goes back to Makai Blackman. I think he's been doing a really good job out there. Sierra Wright and Jacoby Covington, you know, I was concerned about them going into the season. Neither one of them has really given up anything big. Uh, over on the other side. So I think, you know, those two guys have been doing their job. And, and now it comes down to, you know, can you force those tight window throws over the middle? So then you get that tip ball. Now Eric Gentry's size is a, is a factor, whereas a lot of those throws that have been over the middle have been wide open throws. And, you know, you're not going to be able to use your assets that you don't use Eric Gentry's LinkedIn. You don't have Kalen Bullock being able to make a play or Max Williams being a playmaker because everybody's been wide open. And if they get the run game going, Oregon State, now you play action. That creates that big gap. That's where the big gap comes from between the safeties and the linebackers. Linebackers bite on the play action. Now you throw over them. Those are the type of things that can make Oregon State that much more difficult. So I, I think that that's why they're uh, a, a more challenging team. And to answer your question about Fresno State, if USC is getting some pass rush, then yes, it is easier for them because, you know, they have a slew of defensive backs that they really trust. But if you're not getting pressure, then, you know, a guy like Jake Hanner will pick you apart. Yeah, no, I think that that definitely makes sense. Um, speaking about pass rush, I think that's one of the things when I was looking at the game against Oregon State that Fresno State had last week. It's something that they didn't have a ton of. They only had one QB hurry. They had two sacks. But for the most part, there was not a ton of pressure generated by the Fresno State defense. We've mentioned that's their deficiency is on the defensive side of the ball. And it's one of the reasons why I'm a little bit more confident about SC going into this game because we saw the only time that the USC offense has struggled so far this season was when Stanford was able to generate a little bit of pressure. David Bailey, who SC tried to recruit out of modern day, started to, to make some plays. If Fresno State can't generate pressure against Caleb Williams, and he has time to sit in the pocket and be comfortable for all four quarters, I, we've seen what this USC offense can be. And I don't know, RJ, if you notice that as well, but I think that if, if Caleb's going to have the amount of time that uh, Oregon State had last week, USC's offense could do the same thing they did in the first half, maybe for the entire game. Yeah, I mean, I think just because you have two quarterbacks who can throw when they're on the run and they've been flushed and they've been put off platform, it doesn't mean that that's not still what you want to do to them. Like, you, <laughs> like if you leave Caleb Williams alone with the acreage, I mean, it's, he's been playing with, like, a halo around him on a number of plays. If you give him time and space, you're going to get cooked. And I would say virtually the same thing about Jake Hayner. Maybe not quite the same level, but still, right? Maybe you're... You're well done versus a medium, uh, medium done, medium well, whatever. But like, if if you're if you're getting there and you're creating consistent pressure, that's the best path for both of these defenses. Now, which of these defenses is more likely to do that? Probably the USC defense, but they're gonna have to show it. You know, you got You have to do it. And I think, you know, if the USC offense and scores the way we think it will. There's going to be opportunities where suddenly you're up two and three and you can be aggressive defensively. You know, if it takes it, like we saw from Alex Grinch a little bit in the Rice game too, right? Start sending some nickels, start mixing in some stuff that kind of helps you tip the scales. Because again, you get to that three and four score lead and you've changed the game. You've changed what you have to do. You've changed what you need from your best guys. It's just a far better path than dealing with a back-and-forth scenario. If, if, if uh, Fresno State doesn't get any pressure, USC will just walk down the field every drive. You tell If you don't get any pressure on Caleb Williams with the wide receivers USC has, you're telling me you can guard Mario Williams, you can guard Jordan Addison for five or six seconds every play? 
Uh, you know, hell no. Those guys are going to get open every single play if there's no pressure. So that's the big thing. And, hey, maybe Fresno State tries to drop eight, try to do some different things like that to confuse USC. But I think if you don't get any pressure, Caleb Williams will take his time. He won't rush anything. We've seen how – you know, how patient he is in the pocket to go through his reads and make a throw. So I, I think that, you know, USC will just pick him apart if they don't, you know, get any pressure at all. Also, don't sleep on the USC run game. Just going to say that. Um, first of all, for the run game, but also watching eight quarters of a Lincoln Riley offense, there is way more play action than I thought we would see. There are way more plays where there's at least some sort of a give look you know, whether it's a mesh look or RPO look or just a play action fake, he does a lot to mess with your eyes as a defense. And a lot of that is predicated on play action passing. You know, we, we praise Oregon State for doing it, but USC has been doing a lot of that too. And I really think there's an opportunity this week to take another step forward in both of those aspects. Yeah, and I think that like we mentioned the Clay Hilton there a couple times this episode, but that's something that they didn't do last year is when the teams would drop into the soft zones, they couldn't run the ball well enough to get the defense out of the soft zone. They had all the talent on the outside, all the talent at quarterback that we've that SC fans have seen the last couple of years, but they just couldn't run the ball to get teams out of the soft zone. So far, what we've seen from Lincoln Riley and this USC offense through two games is they can run the ball. They've got an experienced offensive line. They've got a great group of running backs who are only getting healthier with, with Relique Brown having another uh, week of rehab. So I think they, they'd be able to run Fresno State out of the soft zone if it came to that. Another question off of YouTube coming from Armand. Is it more likely that USC goes 12-0 and or 10-2 and in the regular season? <laughs> More, more likely. <laughs> 10 and 2. I mean, it's more likely that every team goes 10 and 2 than 12 and 0. 12 and 0 is a lot, even for the absolute best and most complete teams in college football. I mean, nobody went undefeated last year, right? And you're talking about Georgia's of the world and Alabama's of the world and Ohio State's of the world. So, yeah, I, I think 10 and 2. And again, this is, I think, the trap, right, is you're looking at USC's schedule and you're going one by one and you're saying, well, wait a minute, how is this team going to beat them? How is that team going to beat them? And again, in isolation, I think we'd agree, no, that team probably wouldn't, that team probably wouldn't or shouldn't, but it's the accumulation. It's what does this team look like going into game six? What did the five games before that look like? What happens to them in game eight? that sets them up for game nine that nobody knows, you know? And I just think it, it's pretty tough. It's pretty tough to be living in a 12-0 uh, scenario right now, despite as good as things have looked through two. Not only that, you have to look around college football, too. I mean, some, there's just been some crazy upsets already. Alabama almost lost to Texas. Like, Alabama's the team that's supposed to be destined for 12-0, and and they were one Bryce Young run away from losing that game. So uh, you look all around college football. Texas A&M's got a loss now. Uh, Notre Dame's lost twice. It's, there's really it's, – there are a lot of upsets in college football, so I think definitely more likely 10-2 and, and than 12-0. and 0. Shotgun, do you want to start off? There's another question from YouTube. How much of the defensive line's issues can actually be fixed overnight? Uh, I mean, you can't. But I, I think you continue to get better and better as the season progresses. I think that's the big thing is you get more and more comfortable in the defense that you're running, what you're being asked to do, and – you know, if your skill set doesn't perfectly align, what can you do really well? Uh, you know, and the coaches will find that out as the season progresses too. So I think that's what can be, you know, can be fixed. And if you get healthy, that would definitely help. You know, if you get Dejan, if you, you lose a starter, you, you're going to have some issues. Anywhere you go, any spot you have, if you lose a starter, you're going to have some issues. Dejan Benton earned that starting role going into week one. And you saw he made some plays at six tackles against Rice. So you get him back healthy, that helps a little bit. But overnight, I, I don't think you can you can fix things like that. It's going to continue to be, you know, until for them to become an elite group up front and one that can be a national championship contender, that's going to happen with uh, the recruiting, whether it be through the transfer portal or through getting some four- and five-star guys that they can really develop going forward. Marjorie, did you have any thoughts? Yeah, I mean, I think Shotgun nailed it perfectly. I think the other thing I would say is that there's no warp speed to getting to a point where you have a 
room full of defensive linemen who are in year three or four of a Benny Wiley strength and conditioning, right? Like as great as he was, the, that whole roster is only at one summer of him. The best teams have two deeps that are in their third, fourth, or fifth year, especially at those interior line positions, right? And there's just, you know, time and space just do not operate that way. There's no way USC is going to get to a point this year where they've got a bunch of veteran guys. You just have to give it time. Over that time, I think that's where they make the progress. And I think it's not overnight, but I think they're going to move the needle there. I think they're ultimately going to turn the corner there, given enough time. Yeah, I think so and too. You, and you have to build that depth of talent, not just depth of, hey, we got some body. These guys can make some plays, but build the depth of where, you know, your your backup is Will Anderson as a sophomore, or your backup is Jordan Davis as a sophomore. And that's the guy who then as a junior takes over and dominates. You know, that guy that can show you those big time flashes, those five star guys, those should be the backups rather than we got a guy that can fill the spot for us and it's not going to make us look bad. You want a guy that can still make plays when you go to your second stream, guys, and that's where USC is lacking right now as far as the defensive line. They don't have, you know, that playmaker after playmaker. And if you have an injury to Tuli Tui below two, who's going to make plays up front? Then it becomes a big question. You don't go, oh, well, that, there's that guy that's going to make it, and then there's that guy. I mean, look at the Georgia defensive line from last year. The yeah. fact that, they, you know, everyone talked about Jordan Davis. And he wasn't even the number one overall pick. That was Trayvon Walker, who was amazing in his debut this past week uh, for Jacksonville. So, like, that's what you need. You need there to be multiple weapons because then, as RJ referenced earlier, you can't you can't double team Tuli Tuli Polo to 35, 40, 50 snaps a game because there's someone else that's going to be coming and screaming off the edge or, you know, it's going to be disrupting things going up the middle. You know, when you have a bunch of dogs, it makes it easier on everybody. When you only have one guy – Okay, now I can I can game plan for that one guy. We can kind of shut him down. We can run away from him, run towards him. However, we need to you know activate you know our offense to key him out. But if you have multiple guys, that's when everything becomes deadly, and that's why USC's wide receiving group is so you know is so impactful for USC's offense because yeah you, maybe you double team Jordan Addison. Okay, well Mario Williams will throw it in the flat and look what he does makes makes you guys look silly. You know oh you want to play one on one on the outside we'll throw it to Brendan Rice. He's going to go up over you and get it if they don't call a pass interference in the Pac-12. You know, and you got guys like Gary Bryant and uh, Kyron Ware Hudson, all these guys that are waiting in the wings as well. They're just chomping at the bit to, to be able to get their opportunity to go make a big play too. That's the type of room that's elite. USC's wide receiver group went from eh to elite in the in offseason. Now you have to do that with the defensive line. That'll come through the transfer portal as well. I think they'll still hit some there. But it comes with building that talent up from, from the recruiting cycles uh, and the, on the high school side as well. Yeah, I think I'll, I'll even raise the stakes on your Georgia comment. They had three first-round picks on the defensive line. I'd argue that the best player on that defensive line last year is still in school with Jalen Carter. I wouldn't be surprised if he's a top-five pick in the NFL as well. Like that's Just, the... just mauling people last week. When you get the time, which I mean, at least we're only through two games so far watching USC this season. But when they and the coaching staff has more time, they'll be able to develop more of this. So again, it's not going to be fixed overnight. But if you can win while you improve, I think that's a good sign. Uh, one thing that I think that the Trojans do have almost an endless supply of is going to be great plays by Lincoln Riley. There's a question: Do you know if USC has been holding back on offensive plays? We don't know this for a fact. But I think it would be safe to assume that USC is not showing all of their cards throughout the first two weeks. And we saw the play last week with a counter a wide receiver screen that Jordan Addison scored a touchdown on. That was like just one of the best plays that I think a lot of people have ever seen in college football and like well-designed plays. They rolled that out. They didn't use it in week one. They used it in week two. I think there's going to be a little bit more of Lincoln Riley opening up the playbook as we like look forward to some of these games in the Pac-12 and some of the bigger games, bigger matchups that they'll play. I don't know if you guys agree, but uh, it's something that I definitely would expect them to use a little bit more of Lincoln Riley's mind as the season goes on. Yeah, I mean, I think the other key thing to note is that there are plays that he hasn't even invented yet. You know, we've heard... <laughs> We've been hearing constantly about from wide receivers, for every position on the offense. I think Andrew Voorhees talked about it on Tuesday. Like this is an exceptional football mind. So it's not even about like, whoa, well they're they're holding stuff back from from the playbook. There, there's stuff that hasn't been invented yet that we're gonna see as these weeks unfold. You know, so I think yeah, it's a definite thing. But I also think, you know, a lot of this is opponent specific too. 
they're going to use what they need for that week. You know, it's not about showcasing a buffet for everyone in college football to look at. You know what I mean? It's about where can we hurt this team this week? Yeah, and you, you mentioned the the tunnel screen to Jordan Addison. I don't know if I'd go as far as calling it one of the greatest plays we've ever seen in college football play design. But the way that that play built on a different play, and there was another play that built on that play. So USC runs their normal, you know, their GT pool, their guard tackle pool that they run the ball with. They got some yards on that with uh, Travis Dye, the first drive of the game, got down to the, the red zone. They throw the play action, throw it to Lake McCree, touchdown. Okay, they come back, they give that same look. It's one of their staples of their run game. Give the same look, and now the guys that are normally backside are going and throwing those screen blocks. Okay, great play. Nice play right there, 22-yard touchdown for USC. I was most impressed by the third iteration of it, which was later in the game, in the second half, you had Travis die. You faked the handoff to him. You faked the tunnel screen on the backside, and then you threw it out to Travis die. And, you know, the guys that were pulling like they would normally be on the GT pool now became the lead blockers on a screen pass. And they just kind of, you know, Stanford had forgotten about that guy because they're like, oh, this is the this is the tunnel screen on the backside. Be ready for that. And you throw the third one and you just go back to the running back. Like, this is the, the creativity. And these are the things that is so much fun when you're watching a Lincoln Riley offense is how one play can build on another play. And that's why... Uh, as RJ said earlier, a lot of the offense is predicated on just creating all this eye candy for for a defense and how do you sort through, okay, well, that's the tunnel screen versus that's the actual run versus that's a play action faking the tunnel screen back to a screen on the other side. Like all that stuff you're trying to – you're trying to read your keys and you're trying to go off of and do it instantly as things are progressing so quickly. And he just gives you so much to think and comprehend in such a quick action – that that's what makes the the offense really fun and really fun to watch is just you know how he develops plays and builds upon other plays so that you know what you think you're seeing one time might be right when you see it the second time it's completely different it's the same look but it's a completely different play you see it the third time now it's a third iteration of the same thing so those type of things are what's really fun about this offense and yeah so you know are they holding back things from the select little sheet of paper that Lincoln Riley has and he flips over a couple times? Uh, I know that was talked about a little bit on the broadcast. There, there are plays that haven't gone on the sheet of paper yet, but will eventually go on there. There are some special plays. There's some reverses. There's some different things, some, you know, some unique looks out of things that we haven't seen yet. So, yes, they are holding back some offensive plays. Is that for a specific opponent? Is that for a specific look that they get? All that is just depending on the coaching staff and how they kind of implement their offense. So I, I think Lincoln Riley has something up his sleeve at all times, it feels like. Yeah, I think that's that's all we got for questions. Maybe as we wrap this one up, get into our picks. I know the, the spread was at 12 and a half by the time that we had to pick it. Uh, I, I can start first. Uh, I was hesitant because it's such a big spread, I think, for a Fresno State team that is a good team and with a good quarterback. But that being said, I want to know when I pick USC to cover – I think I'm going to do it again, mostly because if, if Fresno State can't get pressure like we've talked about, I think that SC is going to put up a ton of points. It'll be in the Coliseum. I think it'll be one of the more highly attended games of the year, even though Fresno State does transfer or uh, does travel well. I think there'll be a lot of USC energy in the building. And if the if I don't think they're going to take the foot off the pedal in the second half, because I think they realize now that that could put them in a position with a quarterback like Jake Hayner, where there could be some fireworks at the end. So I think that USC is going to be able to put up a lot of points on the scoreboard. I think a two-touchdown win sounds doable. That being said, 12-and-a-half is a big spread for what I think is a good Fresno State team. Go ahead, Jack. Go ahead, RJ. I mean, I, you know, I'm not going to go against Lincoln Riley. You know, he's covered the spread the first two games, so I'm going to continue with that until uh, I'm proven wrong. So, you know, previously, I never believed USC was going to cover the spread. Right now, I'm just going to believe they're going to cover it every time until, until something changes. Yeah, I, I think up until – today or yesterday you might have got me to bite on fresno state but there are only 131 teams in the fbs when you're coming into the coliseum to play lincoln riley with the 105th rated defense through two weeks um you don't have enough i, I just think at the end of the day they just don't and i think you know the big asterisk is of course if they have enough it's not a fourth quarter you really want to look forward to if you're USC. I just think the betting, the smart money, the smart instinct, 
I just don't think they have enough to get it to that fourth quarter where it's close. Well, do you guys have any last comments before we, we wrap the show up? USC Fresno State Saturday uh, we, we night. Got some, we got some rapid fire questions right. here now. Come on now. Right. We always we'll have go. some rapid fire at the end. I have to Blackie work on Chan, this. Blackie Chan, uh, Brandon from Minnesota, wanted to know who do you think is more of a threat? We answered that one. Sorry, wrong, wrong Blackie Chan question. Uh, who will be need to be be Penalty more of an impact? <laughs> who will need to be more of an impact, the D line or the DBs? I'm assuming he means in this week's game. I'll go DBs. Uh, with, with Fresno State being able to pass the ball, I think DBs, if, if I were to pencil in an answer, I'd say the linebacker is more important than both groups, though. Done. RJ, your, your choice? Are we each going to take a whack at these? Are we Some going? of them. Uh, uh, my answer is D-line every game against every opponent all the time. It's the line of scrimmage. You, you dominate at the line of scrimmage. Those second two levels have a much bigger room for error, whereas... If you struggle at the line of scrimmage, it's asking an awful lot for the back end to cover up for it. That's a great, great point right there. Scott Fortes wanted to know where in the world has Earl Barquette gone to. He did get in and make his debut last uh, last weekend against Stanford, so he's around. We'll see if he gets uh, continues to play his way into some more opportunities as well. Blackie Chan also wanted to know where does Fresno State's defense stack up to Stanford's defense? What do you think, RJ? Um they're worse. I can just <laughs> – it's not even what I think. Uh, actually, no, they're slightly better. Stanford is the 115th rated defense. This is points per drive, which when you when you just want the bare bones, when you just want to know, that's kind of where I go with, especially because uh, BCF Toys filters out uh, garbage time drives, end-to-half kneel downs and all that stuff. So these are true numbers. Um, so, yeah, I spoke a little bit too quickly. Stanford is actually even more horrific than I thought. So – Good times for the alumni. We'll just go with they're but both bad. Stanford also had to face USC's offense already. We'll that see where true. Fresno's numbers rate after facing USC compared to Stanford's after they face somebody else this weekend. Yeah, Stanford, um, well, Stanford's got a bye, so they're definitely going to improve this week. They will not give up any <laughs> touchdowns. I can promise that. Shut out. Goose egg this week. Guarantee. That's a lock. We had a couple of questions about the Lincoln Riley's offense. Alex asked, Given the complex plays of Lincoln Riley, how hard is it for opposing coaches to break down USC's offense and teach their players to defend it? And then we had another question that asked, uh, Steve asked, how do you think opposing coaches try to game plan against USC? Do they watch OU tape from last season? You can't watch SC from last season. It seems like there's so little data for coaches to use. And I think that's one of the challenges of, especially early in the season, uh, game planning against USC is, hey, you can watch the Oklahoma offense and see what they do. But then you gotta okay, we gotta watch the Pittsburgh tape to see you know what Jordan Addison looks like individually. We gotta watch the Colorado tape to see Brennan Rice and Makai Blackman. You know you're gonna watch those first two games, but if you want more in depth stuff going forward, if you're Fresno State or Oregon State, you gotta go back and you start looking at tape from around the country at different colleges because you know USC's uh, you know their roster is so diverse uh, from what you would normally see in a, a given season. Yeah, I think the more games that SC plays this season, too, like in a, in a couple of weeks, there'll be more games to look at this season. So I think Fresno State, they'll probably start by watching the Rice and the Stanford tape, and then maybe you go into Oklahoma, and then maybe you look at a couple of players. But I was going to make that point earlier. It's just so hard to, to game plan against Lincoln Riley normally. But then when you can't use tape from all one place to, to, to try and gather what he's doing, I think it makes it even, even harder. Joshua Shaw want to know, do you think all think that Corey Foreman has been given ample opportunity to play and it's now time to move him down the depth chart, allow Solomon Bird and others a chance to play and prove themselves? I think it comes down to earning time, right? You know, and just let's not forget Corey Foreman is still a true sophomore who missed his senior season because of the COVID pandemic. So let's not write him off just yet. Still the number one player in the country coming out of high school, was still really good, still has shown flashes, just hasn't shown consistency. Yeah, I think it will continue to be a week-by-week week thing. I think that's kind of what their attitude is with everybody. Um, I will say that it seems pretty clear that this staff is not just going to hand reps to Corey Foreman or anybody else because of where they came from. I think Lincoln Riley made that comment maybe the day he arrived or his first or second presser that we talked to him. But um, Corey Foreman's going to get what he earns, and – no more, no less. I think that's maybe one of the best things we can say about this staff, whether it's Corey Foreman or anybody at this point. Yeah, I definitely think so, too. Yeah, great point there. Alex, want to know, did Stanford wet the field on purpose to slow down USC? 
the the field wasn't wet until the end because it started sprinkling towards the end of the game. But and RJ can probably speak on this. It seemed like Austin Jones, uh, when we were talking to him after the game, was like, "This is a common issue with the field at Stanford. It's just that you know you have to the turf will start tearing up pretty quickly, and you have to kind of change the way you run. You know the fact that you're not trying to make any super quick cuts and different things like that." Yeah, it, it's tough because as one of the few schools still using real grass, which I just personally support, want to endorse, want to see as much of as possible, it's tough to, to criticize the few schools that do it. That turf has been problematic over the years. I think a lot of it is just the location, just the design, the way they go about it, um, the way they use it and don't use it. It tends to be cut thicker. I think you guys can even you know, shotgun just walking on it it's not the same as when you're walking on the Coliseum grass. And I think when you, when you cut it thicker, that kind of slows things down categorically. But I also think it, lead, it you're susceptible to kind of clumsier, chunkier divots that you get. I'm not an expert. I think I've made that obvious in the last 30 seconds. But <laughs> yeah, it's a problem. It's been a problem. It's far from their biggest problem. It wasn't Sh Soldier Field, though. That was, that was horrible. That was also in a monsoon, so we'll true. give them a little bit of a, uh, of a pass there. Megan, want to know, I'm loving the huge blowouts that we've seen, but do you think USC will win the one- or two-point games? I think that's the big question we'll still have to learn later in the season. And when that one- or two-point game comes may determine you know whether USC can win it or not just based on where they are as a team, where they are as their team chemistry, and all those type of things. Yeah, close games are toss-ups. So really it kind of goes into the theme of what we've been talking about you want USC to have to win one or two close games. If they're playing four, five, or six close games, X amount of those are just not going to go your way, just categorically, no matter who you are, Alabama, whoever. So it's really about keeping that need down to one or two games as opposed to three, four, or five. Because you get to that many, you're going to lose them. It doesn't matter. You do everything right. You do everything wrong. Like, you're going to drop close games. That's why it's so important not to be in them. Uh, we had a couple of questions about the linebackers. SoCal Dad said outside of starters, which linebackers are ahead of Rajon Davis? Uh, and the biggest one is Tua Sibi Nomura. If you're counting Raylan Goforth as one of the starters, those two guys are your backups. And then you get to Rajon uh, Davis. David Johnson asked, Tua Sibi Nomura made one of the mem more memorable hits in the Stanford game. Do you think he'll get more work? Uh, not not this week, maybe against Oregon State because they'll use some two tight end looks and stuff, and maybe USC goes to a heavy package. But so far, looking at some of the rotations and stuff, there's not a ton of player-for-player uh, player substitutions. Hey, we want to get Jacoby Covington uh, some drive, so he's splitting time with Sierra Wright. But outside of that, it's not like the, the defensive line, you're rotating guys all the time, but you're not just putting Raylan Goforth out there because we want to get him some reps. Like, those are – is basically starter straight away. Like, no one's coming in for Caitlin Bullock to get them some work. No one's coming in for, for Max Williams to get them some work. You know, you're seeing a little bit with uh, or with um, with Jalen Smith and Latrell McCutcheon on the defensive side, them rotating a little bit. But, you know, the linebackers, you're pretty set. It's going to be Eric Gentry. It's going to be – I mean, it's going to be um, Shane Lee. And then when you go to some heavier packages, that's when you've seen Raylan Goforth come in with three linebackers. That's when you've seen Tua C.V. Nomura come in. They had a four linebacker package in the game. So that's why those guys, you know, I don't see them, you know, unless they do something during the practice week to jump over Shane Lee or Eric Gentry, I don't think you're going to see uh, those guys kind of making that jump forward. And then we had Ramalama Ding Dong want to know, Lincoln Riley or Cliff Kingsbury as USC head coach? That seems like a pretty simple one to me. I don't know about you guys. I'll take Lincoln Riley. Yeah, I'm more fascinated by Ramalama Ding Dong, the handle, than I am the question. <laughs> uh, Desmond want to know, how good is it for USC to finally have a mobile quarterback that throws just as good or better than our QBs of the last 10 years? USC catching up on the times of offense. It opens up so much. Yeah, it's great for that, but can you make the other throws? And that's what's special about Caleb Williams. It's not that he's a mobile quarterback, it's that – he makes the throws in the pocket. He makes the throws on the run. And USC's had a couple quarterbacks in the past that were good on the run, even though they weren't necessarily quote-unquote mobile quarterbacks. Cody Kessler, I thought Keaton Slovis, especially earlier in his career before the shoulder injury, both made good off-platform throws. That's not a big deal. It's, you know, it's can you make that throw in the pocket and then, it, you know, you get pressure. Can you still, you know, look downfield and make the plays? 
Now Caleb Williams gives you a different dynamic because he can take off running as well. But I think, you know, I'm still of the idea that you can win with a, you know, pocket quarterback. And until that Tom Brady guy stops playing and, you know, he doesn't win any more Super Bowls, then I don't know how you can say that you can't win with a, with a pocket quarterback. As they, you definitely, you can win. That being said, uh, what Caleb can bring to the table running wise is something that he, I don't think has had in a while. And it is definitely something that sets you apart and it gives you a safety blanket when the offensive line isn't playing its best. Caleb can escape and make some great runs. Yeah. It's, it's, it's also luxury. the chaos theory, the chaos theory. There's a lot when chaos happens in college football, mobile quarterbacks can make, you know, crazy things happen. You see that with uh, Anthony Richardson against Utah, you know, you, you get a lot more chaos in college football games. And when that happens, you know, someone who keeps the play alive a little bit longer can make some special things. Is that the last question? RJ, do you want to jump in? No, because we I have, have one last whole, question. I have like a marathon rant on the whole dual versus pocket <laughs> thing. And we're, and I'm saving that for either something I write or something we have a lot more time for. So let's, let's just <laughs> gotcha. cap it off. Let's cap it off with something else. All right. The last question that we have uh, for, for this week. It's from Big T's, directed at me. With Ryan out, can we get a small basketball ramp uh, rant? The coaching staff is putting in the work recruiting Collier. That'd be Isaiah Collier, the number one player in the country. Uh, Arrington Page, Silas uh, De Demery, and Flowers, Tristan Flowers, I believe that is. Uh, Pac-12 dumb schedule for SC UCLA on January 5th. Women's basketball have a shot with Juju Watkins. I don't know the women's basketball recruiting very well. But, yes, the coaching staff definitely is putting in work this open period. They have been all over the country. You know, been, they were out to see Silas Demery, I believe, today. If it wasn't yesterday, they went their first trip of the open period was to go to, you know, go to Georgia, go outside of Atlanta, go to Wheeler High School, which is where Isaiah Collier and Arrington Page both play. They are in the top four for Arrington Page. He just released his top four the other day. They're still considered one of the favorites for Isaiah Collier. That would be a huge get for USC. It's the corner, it's the point guard that they've been waiting on uh, since you know Jordan McLaughlin was with the program. They haven't had that elite point guard to kind of lead everything. So yes, I, I think that they're putting in the work and they're just waiting for one of those first dominoes. They get Collier, then I feel like they can get Page, you know, and things will kind of fall into place there. And as far as the Pac-12 schedule, they released their the conference dates, the official dates for the games um, for this season, the men's basketball schedule. And they put USC UCLA on January 5th, which is a Thursday. And then they will put that's at Poly Pavilion. They will play at USC on January 26th. That is also a Thursday. I think it's dumb to put those games on Thursday just because LA traffic, all those things. You want to be able to have it on the weekend. You know, if it's not going to be the last game of the season, which has been the last couple of years, which is awesome, that creates that environment, you know, that the special, you know, the intrigue of where the teams are going to be because they've been battling so much as far as Pac-12 standings and seedings and all those things. If you're going to move it up in the schedule and not have it at the, at the end of the season, why the hell would you put it on a Thursday? And the first one, the January 5th game, UCLA students are already back in, in class. So, you know, you're going to wonder if they're going to get a packed house. You would expect they still would, but, you know, why dampen things? And that makes me wonder, and maybe you guys can finish this show off, do you think the Pac-12 is doing this on purpose? Because those two schools seem to be leaving from the Pac-12 here before too long. Oh, that's a saucy little conspiracy theory there. I mean, I, I think I think it's a less devious thing. I think it's, first of all, it's short-sighted to have both those games scheduled so close. Like, why are we really going to go, what, five, the final five or six, the final six weeks of the year, and those teams have already played twice? Don't really get the value of that. I'm also now super leery that we're going to look at a dreaded 8 p.m. Pacific start time, just in case anyone <laughs> across the country wanted to watch that game. But I think, you know, you put them on Thursday because it's a guaranteed market for Thursday. You have a game that is going to get numbers, period, as opposed to maybe getting lost in a Saturday weekend shuffle where you're kind of competing against the rest of the entire country. That's the best I can do. It isn't how I'd schedule it regardless, though. No, I don't have a huge problem with Thursday because I only have one class on Thursday. I have no classes on Friday <laughs> either. So Thursday Thursday at you like noon. You selfish mother. Thursday at noon yeah. is basically Friday for me. But that being said, it, I mean, it's a trend that the Pac-12 just 
they don't prioritize SC. Like I think SC realized that they should be prioritized. I think UCLA felt the same thing too. That's why they're leaving for the Big Ten. This is just one in a long line of similar things. We can even mention the fact that the USC Oregon State game is going to be late night on Pac-12 Network, despite maybe being one of the best games in the conference all year. There's, I think there's, it's just proving USC right for leaving the Pac-12. All right, wrap it up for us there, Jack. Send us home. All right. Well, this has been a great show. USC, Fresno State, this weekend, a late night game at the Coliseum. Lincoln Riley, everyone else wants you guys to go to the Coliseum. Fresno State's going to travel pretty well, so I think uh, this would be a good game to go out to. We'll, we'll see one of the more packed houses I think we'll see all year. USC's 2-0. and It was great to preview it with you guys. Make sure you guys are leaving a like and a comment and following us on whatever platform you're watching on, be it Twitter, Facebook, or YouTube. I'm Jack Smith here with Shotgun uh, Remotely and then RJ in the studio. Thank you guys. Make sure you check out all the other stuff on the channel, and we'll see you guys on Sunday for the recap show after USC and Fresno State.